Hey everybody, welcome back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. Now, I'm really excited, I gotta tell you. I think we may have re-released this podcast once or twice, but it's that good that I want to do it again. So I want to take you back to, now was it June or July? I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I'm going to pick June. Well, we're going to say June. In June, all the did growth month. And it's that interesting. My cat has come to say hello to you. So you can't beat live production, guys. We had one of the smartest people I've ever met come on to growth month and tell us how he took his company that basically he was the, the guy who founded the HubSpot agency partner program. And he took that from nothing to about 10 mil. And then he comes in as a CEO of a, of a software company. They've got a great idea. They've got a great product and a great kind of concept. They're struggling to take it to market and really make it grow and spread its wings. He comes in and now they're about 6 mil a year. So uh, safe to say, he's done a decent job. I wanted to ask him, how did you do it? What have you done along the way? First, uh, first things that you did, first hires. And uh, safe to say, Peter didn't disappoint. So here's Peter from Databox, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Ollie here again. You've probably seen me a fair few times. You're probably sick of me by now, but you will not be sick of today's guest. Peter, someone I followed on uh, on LinkedIn. He doesn't post so much there, but on Twitter, he's well worth it. Definitely worth a follow over there. Posts quite a lot. Talks a lot about his company's marketing, about what they're doing. They're, f- they're fanatical with the blog. Let me tell you that. It's all the time. I only wish that we could keep up with that schedule, but enough about that for now. Um, Peter, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome to Growth Month. How are you doing? Uh, great, Ali. It's good to talk to you again and uh, excited to be part of Growth Month here. Yeah, it's been a while. So we had um, we had you on our podcast. It was actually a year ago now. So we launched it last year. You were one of the first five episodes. So what has changed since then? Uh, we've grown a little bit. I think we were just shy of 4 million ARR there. We're almost at 6 million. We're at 5.9. So that was about... Um, a year ago, just like you said, I uh, actually went back and looked to see when we when we recorded it, which was probably a little bit more than a year ago. So uh, last I did the calculation quarter over quarter, we grew about 48 percent. Um, so I don't know if that's the exact math, but that's about it. About right. Awesome. So, um, all right, I'm going to dig up my notes. But just before we do that, why don't you um, can you do a little backstory? Uh, tell us about your HubSpot days, about how you came to be Databox's CEO. Sure. Yes. I was uh, employee uh, 15 at HubSpot, fourth on the sales team. Uh, I had um, run a small SaaS startup before that, um, before they, we called it SaaS, software as a service. So uh, joined in the sales team. Um, there was It was a pretty early product. We basically were selling a keyword research tool for SEO and and a, a form builder for landing pages and a blog built in on uh, .NET Nuke. And so it was really early days. We had to figure out how do we sell it, um, and uh, and then how do we build the org. Uh, or build the org. I ended up um, running a 300 person team um, before I left there. I spent nine years there. Um, during that time, I started the channel program for HubSpot, which was basically uh, having marketing agencies resell the software. Uh, as part of their service offering and uh, scaled that up to about 40% of the revenue there at HubSpot. Uh, So had a great run there, learned a hell of a lot, very thankful to be part of that story and thankful to many of the people that um, I got to work with and for and uh, worked for me there, Uh, learned a hell of a lot. Yeah, but the company got really big. Um, it, I wasn't as passionate about where they were going, although they were crushing it, and I kept a lot of stock, and I'm still very bullish on, on HubSpot. Um, but wanted to be an entrepreneur again like I was before I had joined HubSpot, and, and frankly, like I got to be at HubSpot for many years there, running running a program and building out a team. Uh, and so I started looking for opportunities, ended up um, talking to some VCs. I was going to start my own thing. Uh, and one of the VCs I met with at Accomplice, uh, TJ Mahoney, said, hey, you got to meet Davin Gebrovec, who is the co-founder of Databox. Um, they had actually, Accomplice was, and Founder Collective were the two main investors in, uh, in Databox before I joined. Uh, they had raised $3.8 million before I joined. Unfortunately, once they raised that money, the, w- their original business plan, original market, original product just didn't work. And so they were in the process of pivoting. Uh, they had slimmed their team way down. Unfortunately, had burned about three million of the three point eight that they had raised. Uh, so it was about eight hundred left. And so I joined. It just pivoted to more of a 
small business focus to uh, building out integrations with marketing tools. Um, and I realized there was an opportunity to take what I had learned at HubSpot, both in terms of scaling a SaaS business, as well as what I learned about marketing agencies and marketers, selling to marketers, uh, and apply that at Databox. So that, that was 2017. Okay, so lots going on there. So you joined, if, if I had that right, just just make sure I, if we got this correct. You joined during the pivot or, or was that kind of your first initiative um, to, to change the strategy? They had started the pivot kind of right when I started talking to them and I joined a few months in. Um, I actually, um, at the time at HubSpot, I, was, um, I had kind of quit my job at HubSpot but stayed at HubSpot um, to help through transitions. Uh, and I was basically writing for the HubSpot sales blog at the time. HubSpot was just getting going with selling a CRM and sales software. And so um, I had consulted a little bit on side with a handful of startups, including Databox. Um, and so they had started to make the pivot. I had introduced some people I know to check out the product and start using it. Uh, and so when I joined, we kind of had narrowed down where we were going to initially focus the, the market, the product. Um uh, features, et cetera. And so when I joined, I kind of hedged some of the risk by getting to know the part, getting to know the team a little bit, um, getting to know if we could work together um, and all that. I didn't spend a lot of time with them, but it spent some time over six months with them to kind of get to know them. So not in consulting times, but when you start full-time CEO, what are the first mm -hmm. few things that you do? So from the offset, I know there's a, there's a free trial. I've, I've used it. I still have it, I believe. Mm -hmm. There's a hell load of content that you guys do all the time, and your director of marketing is a very uh, prevalent speaker on that as well. Um, yep. I, I believe you, we've talked about this before. Your support and the development, they uh, there's a big effort there on the team. To they're Absolutely. very very process oriented. So so what did you have when you started? What was the state of play, and where did you sort of go from that point? Yeah. So um, my thesis at the time in 2017, which hasn't changed a whole lot, is that. Um, the way software is being bought uh, was changing drastically around that time. I think it started a few years before uh, with some early companies that were doing freemium. Obviously, I'm a big fan of, of content marketing coming from HubSpot and saw how that can really reduce your cost of customer acquisition for a SaaS company. Um, and, and so we, I guess the two really important things in the beginning that were very conscious decisions. One is we we're going to go to market through content marketing. Um, we, I had raised about a 1.1 million um, when I joined. And so we had 1.9 million in the bank um, when, uh, when I joined in 2017. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of money to spend on a sales team or even a marketing team or paid search or anything. So at the time, in the very beginning, I just hired two people, relatively junior people, one in marketing, one to handle customer support, and I was doing sales and managing them. Uh, and so, but I knew content marketing was key. So I had one person focusing on that uh, right from the get go. Um, that helped us initially kind of just have content in the sales process, start to test uh, what kind of content would resonate, what kind of messages would resonate with people. Uh, it started to build some search traffic, but not a whole lot at the time. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, from the beginning, content marketing ones. The other one was going freemium. Um, HubSpot at the time was kind of just getting into freemium. Uh, they had a product called HubSpot Signals, which was the um, the, uh, the beginning of Hubs the HubSpot sales product um, before they even had a CRM. Uh, and so I got to see a little bit firsthand, or at least from observation of how freemium can really help improve sales productivity in a SaaS company. So by offering a free product, you get people signing up, you get people using it. You sometimes you even get people buying it before even talking to them. Uh, and so uh, that was another key thing uh, that we decided. So on day one, it was content marketing and freemium. And those were like unquestionable focus areas for us. Okay, so before we go into the content side of it, because that's obviously a very, very big bit mm -hmm. for freemium, was was that a big undertaking, development wise, and all that sort of thing and process, or was it um, not? There, not a big so deal? there was a. They had already built like the system in place to you know let someone sign up for free. Um, they had a a, um, a a way to kind of walk them through the first few setup steps in the product that was initially built. We've spent a lot of time and, and money on improving that and still are improving that, but, but, um, that was already in place. 
Um, at the time, they had a, like a really, really limited free product, which I think made sense because they had no idea um, what would trigger someone to buy. And so I made that free product more generous. And then as we added features, um, most of the time we added them into the free product. Um, and so uh, over time, that product got um, more generous. But, uh, but that was already in place, the basics of it. Okay, so I was going to ask you something else, but I've got to go further down that rabbit hole. So sure. uh, I, I think sometimes you you get caught in between the two ways to do freemium. Sometimes people do yeah. like have everything for a limited amount of time, and hopefully you want it enough that the, the time gate is enough. Or the other way yeah. is you get like a small frequency of usage of everything, and then it annoys you because you don't get to use it enough, so you buy it. Wh- wh- which way did you go, and did you get caught in the middle? Mm-hmm. We're kind of caught in the middle, although I think the middle might be the right way. It's I feel like it's the right way for us. It might be the right way for other companies. So I'll explain what I mean by being in the middle just to make sure we're on the same page. But we have the free product. Um, we get over 5,000 signups a month for it, for that free product, all from our content marketing, uh, brand awareness, things like that. Um, and... Once someone's in the free product, they might either trip uh, uh, a limit, meaning they might um, use a feature or want to use a feature um, more than we allow in the free product, or they might want to accomplish something when the in the product that we don't allow in the free product. So in other words, like not have access to a feature is the simplest way to explain it. Uh, and so what we have is a system where we get people signing up for their free product and some people use it for a while uh, and just use it f- forever. We have some, you know, perennial free users um, and some people use it and then go away. In fact, that's probably the, lo- that is the largest percentage, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's pretty true. Of a lot of premium products. And then some people use it, hit those limits pretty quickly and start a trial. And we, over time, we initially had to manually manage trials, et cetera. But now we have an automated trial where they, if they hit that limit, we prompt them to start a trial. Uh, and when they're in the trial, then they can do anything they want. They can use the product at whatever level they want, uh, depending on which features they use and and the level to which they use them. You know, they would buy one of our three plans. Uh, so um that's the way we're set up so it's free plus free trial and the reason why i think that works for us and might work for other companies is i think free helps us get signups so when you offer a free trial somebody has to make that decision like do i really have time in the next two whatever weeks to to try this product set it up and use it um or um or not and if i don't then i might not do that free trial whereas if it's free i'm a little more inclined to just all right let's check it out and it's more of an impulse try, you know, trial in a way. Uh, there's no friction there. Um, also, you know, for smaller businesses, having a free product certainly gets them in the door. Some of them, of course, buy um, because they're thinking, "All right, I'll try the free product out and see if it serves my needs." Um, and some some it does, many it doesn't. Um, and so I think having the free version drives signups. Um, it also works well with a conversion strategy we have where we offer free dashboard templates for people that we've built. So somebody is a Google Analytics user. We have, I don't want to say probably not hundreds, but tens of templates that they can literally click, just connect their GA and immediately see their data inside the the dashboard. Um, So by having those available for free and usable in the free product, we're able to drive a lot of signups that way. That's, I believe, somewhere around 1,600 of our signups every month is someone trying a, trying a template. Um, and then by having the trial, um, it gives us a really good signal of who's serious, right? If somebody's in the free product and then they trigger the trial, um, then they're, they, they know there's a paid version at least. They might not be willing to pay for it. It might not be what they need, but it does give us an indication. And, and so we look at like our free users, let's say they convert at X, the free trials convert almost at um, 2X of that. Uh, so it's a really good indication for our um, support team uh, that focuses on our prospects to to reach out and, uh, and offer assistance. Got it. Yeah. As you were explaining it, I was thinking to myself, so the conversion from free into the trial could be almost whatever. Obviously, you want it to be great, don't you? But the yeah. trial to pay 
is probably almost double, hopefully even more than that. Yeah, because they've yeah, built yeah. a case it's, for yeah, using it's... it and they've got past that case of, like I sign up to free stuff all the time. Yeah, so what, you know, but if I've bothered to go to the extra extent, you're almost, I'm way further down the funnel than just one extra click, although it might just be one click, right? Right, yep, yep, exactly. Got you, okay, so so content, I'm watching the clock and I got plenty of questions for you on your content, believe me. <laughs> um, so funny enough, one of my former bosses, he worked for a competitor of, um, of HubSpot, and when the first okay. time we met, he was telling me like, dude, we haven't got any content, like HubSpot are killing us. And I, he recorded me saying to his, uh, to his boss, his VP of marketing, he recorded a video of me saying, you know, HubSpot are just going to kill you over and over again because they publish like eight blogs a day. Like every time I want to know something, I go there, don't I? Who do you think I'm buying? Right. And he sent that to the right. whatever, uh, that company. So you guys do a fairly similar thing in, in a sense maybe not like nine blogs a day but you're doing so much yeah. and the thing that strikes me uh, may, i'm thinking this is intentional by the nature of your platform you integrate with a lot of tools a lot of companies you've partnered with them very well it is a, is something i'm saying from the bat so you've gone to like zapier or, or whatever zapier if, if that's how you say it all right. of those and you've embedded them into loads of the content and obviously that's backlinks galore that's social shares you've just made this massive groundswell out of it but some people work really hard to make a blog and they do that over yeah. and over again you've made a yeah. lot more out of that haven't you yeah so we've done a few things on on the blog first of all like SEO works really well when you have a lot of topics you can cover. And so not only do we integrate with lots of other software tools that we can write about or that give us topics to write about, the, more, the most important thing is there is we have lots of topics to write on. So that SEO works really well. So that's one thing that we're, we're doing. Uh, we have focused in on, you know, marketing topics or marketing integrations. Like we integrate with Xero and QuickBooks, but we probably just have a handful of articles on them. We're not focused in on selling to accountants or uh, accounting firms right now um but we do have like almost unlimited number of things to write about not only can we write about tools like we just published a guide on semrush um but we can also write about seo the topics that semrush covers like backlink analysis or um, how to get backlinks things like that so it gives us plenty of topics um and that that really helps us with SEO. I kind of lost my train of thought and lost what your question was, but did I cover it? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. So, um, so at what point in the in the journey that you st you started off with fairly uh, with fairly junior people at the day one when you joined? When did uh, that? And I know you scaled it very quickly, but when did that really take off? And when did you add people to that? Uh, so marketing was actually one of the last things I'd say we started to scale. We really just started to grow the marketing team this year. I think we're up to like 12 team members in marketing. Um, so what we first started building out was the support team. Um, most of our team is remote. We have a lot of team members in um, South America, Central Europe. We have some team members in Africa. So we're all kind of with Pakistan. We have pretty much, I think we have like 20 countries covered. Um, and so the, but the first thing we did was start building out that support team because we have freemium users, right? Because we have people in a free trial, um, selling our product didn't require like proact and we have lots of signups from content marketing. We didn't have to have like a prospecting team, although we're building one now. Um, we didn't have to have, you know, um, really experienced salespeople, uh, although we do have six, some experienced salespeople now. Um, and so we just built a really big team. And I want to say we have about 30 people on our support team. And I'd say a little less than half are focusing on prospects and a little less than half, a little more than half are focusing on, on customers, um, at least in terms of the time split. And, uh, and so that was really that first team we built. Um, I did hire some, uh, you know, a few senior people uh, fairly early on Um uh, Billy McDonald, who ran a customer uh, su success team at HubSpot, selling, uh, servicing the SMB market. I think he ran a team of like 30 people or so at HubSpot. Um, and then I brought in John John Bonini. He actually like um, approached me. I wasn't going to hire someone to run marketing. I was you know managing two people myself there. Uh, but he's like, I, I want to work at Databox. I want to work with you. I had known him. Um, he ran marketing at uh, an agency that was a HubSpot partner early on, uh, followed him on his podcast, things like that. So um, he ended up joining the team 
Um, and then uh, another person who I who my, actually was my first hire, she really did an amazing job developing into a leader. Uh, and she now runs um, my revenue operations team. So uh, right now I have those three main reports. You also work really closely with the co-founder who runs product and engineering and people. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's our team. And then, of course, we have some more senior leaders on the engineering and product team. We just hired our first like senior HR person, um, someone with a lot of HR experience, people ops, people experience. Um, and then uh, we've also hired a lot of senior engineers. All that, that team is all in Central Europe, uh, where the co-founder lives and is from. Got you. Okay, so I'm just scouring my notes. I don't think I've actually heard you in, uh, in anything, to be honest, or maybe I missed it, uh, but definitely not in my notes, spoken about a sales team or or further plans for it. So obviously with the amount of freemium and the amount of trial, mm. that's going to you know take quite a lot of the money, uh, the, the revenue share there for you. But like uh, I don't know if you know Cloud App, but I know certainly when I worked with them, mm. they had like a similar model, lots and lots and lots of freemium, but they had account executives yeah. who were in charge of sometimes picking out just generally speaking we want this logo we're going to go and approach them like any sales team but they mm -hmm. have the benefit of we've got a freaking huge pool of people that use us you bet there's probably quite a lot of some of the big companies out there anyway why don't we try and get like a big deal license there so talk to me right. about that how, yeah how most that companies so most companies that have like a hybrid most SaaS companies that have a hybrid between like freemium and sales led motions um delineated that way we're like we'll just let the small businesses buy through the freemium and if they figure it out they figure it out and, and then but then the sales team's going to go after the big bigger companies that have bigger deals um, we are not set up that way i'm not saying we wouldn't maybe do that in the future um our product is a little unique we're actually the only one that really offers a free product in our market except for google data studio um which i think um you know, every, uh, Google offers a lot of free products and, and it's uh, mostly technical people that figure that out or more technical people figure that out. Um, and so there's no one else other than, you know, Google with their deep pockets that offers a free product. Uh, and the reasoning, uh, I believe for that, I've talked to all our competitors, but the reasoning for that is that it's, it, uh, it requires uh, quite a bit of effort to get our product set up the way someone wants it to be set up because we're selling custom dashboard and custom report automation tools so you can't like we can't know what you want to track for your kpis only you're going to know that and so we need to make it easy as possible but at the end of the day you have to choose what metrics you want on your dashboard and your reports and all that so uh what we've done is build out a sales team to help people go through that process because uh, frankly most Small businesses have no idea where still where to start. Even though our software is easy to set up and requires just points, clicks, and decisions, um, you know, people get a little overwhelmed with the options, and um, they need help narrowing down what what they should be looking at, how they should structure those reports or dashboards, how they should visualize certain data. Uh, in some cases, you know, how should I analyze this data? I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, or I don't know what this metric means, or I don't even know what metrics I should be tracking. So, um, so our sales team is good at that part of it. Uh, we also, our support team also helps. In fact, um, a little over a year ago, we started building out processes for specific integrations that we have where we ask the user a few questions about what they're doing or how they're using that integration. And we look at their data and we just build dashboards for them. So if somebody is an e-commerce company using Google Analytics, we can guess fairly, fairly accurately the you know ninety percent of what they would want to track and ask them a few questions about it and then go build them a set of dashboards and we've done that for nearly three thousand companies uh, to date um, and so that's and that's all asynchronously we basically have them fill out a form or answer a few questions we go build the dashboards we send them back an email with what we did um, so so both the support team and the sales team is really there to help people do that custom setup work. Got you. Okay. All right. I'm I'm watching the clock, and we've we've spoken about how you got to now, but I'm, but I'm interested in the future. I have more time if you want to go over. <laughs> oh, believe me, I'll take you up on that. But um, but, yeah, but what's what's so. next then? So this has been what what uh between three and five years for you now, and uh, a couple yeah. rounds, a bit of money spent, and um, and you've got to this point, just shy of six million. So, 
what's next and in my notes i've got a few different things um it's funny there's a few things on on this list which are on mine as well but most notably second product that's a big one yep yep what's going on yeah so um so we want we're we're tra- in the transitioning from being a single product company to a multi-product company um always a tricky transition i think most companies start to think about it now and kind of figure it out around 10 million arr uh, we're doing it now. I probably a little ahead of what most companies do um, because our existing product is difficult to sell, sell and service around. And so we want to build a, a product that um, we think adds a different value, uh, complementary value, but uh, might be a lot easier um, to sell and market. Um, the first product we're building um, that's next is uh, called Benchmark Groups. What it'll allow. Um, a company to do is uh, join a group uh, that of like companies and instantly see how their KPIs um, compare, their performance compares to uh, the median of that group or the distribution of that group. So if you are a SaaS software company doing between five and 10 million selling in a freemium motion to marketers, Right, we'll have a group of thirty or fifty companies that have opted in to anonymously um, share their performance. And when you join that group, you'll instantly see, okay, here's my traffic, here's my website conversion rate, um, here's my MRR, here's my payment terms, whatever those metrics might be that you'd want to compare. You'll be able to um, to choose them and compare. Um, and what we'll be doing is allowing agencies or consultants to form these groups. So we work with about a thousand marketing agencies now. Um, some of them focus in on niches. Like I was talking to one the other day who focuses in on helping pest management control companies market. So like if you have a bug problem or a rodent problem, you would call this company. Uh, and so there are thousands of those in the US. I'm sure there's many more outside of the US as well. Um, and so that's what their specialty is. So they're gonna build a group of pest control management companies and show those individual pest control management companies how their marketing and sales performance compares to uh, the median of the group. Where do I sign up? Just just asking. <laughs> when it's ready. Um, it's not live yet. It'll, it'll be at uh, databox. It'll actually probably be at benchmarks.databox.com or, or databox.com slash benchmarks. If you follow our blog or follow me on Twitter at PC4Media or follow Databox HQ on, on Twitter, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be sharing it when it's live. So what's, um, what's gone into that? Obviously quite a lot of development, that sort of stuff. How, um, well, what, yeah. you weren't, I say this, as I said, this is if you were the, the founder at the very beginning, how much different is this launch going to be to the initial Databox launch as, as, as close to it as we could compare? Yeah. Yeah, so the company actually started 10 years ago. I've only been here for a little over five. But um, the initial launch was selling um, a mobile app to larger enterprises to help them track their performance. So similar to what we do now, but it was only mobile. And they sold these really big implementation deals with really big companies you recognize like Bose and Converse and um, and uh, Staples, uh, the uh, office uh, store. Um, so... That was the initial one. I have no idea how it worked. I actually um, saw them a little later on. had no idea what they were doing. And then um, when I jumped in, our initial launch was really very quiet. It was more of like, hey, I have this new tool that I'm – a company I joined, this new tool that I'm che- um, selling. Uh, it helps you know agencies with automating their reporting process. You want to check it out. So that was our initial one. So now that we have you know almost 3,000 customers, um, you know, great domain authority, big email list – uh, et cetera, we'll be doing a whole lot more. We have a product marketing team that will be launching it. And we're also building out a team. Um, uh, I'm calling it a, a community development team. Um, it'll serve a similar function as what most sales development teams do, where they're trying to reach out and engage people. Our process and methodology be quite different. It's something we've um, been developing for the last few years. Um, and so we'll use that, that team will be responsible for recruiting people to both join benchmark groups and then start benchmark groups. Um, I don't know if you've read the, um, the book, uh, the network effect by Andrew Chen from a 16 Z, but we'll, we'll be Flintstoning the benchmark groups. 
um, uh, is the term he uses, just like Flintstone, where they don't have an, an engine and they use their feet to propel their car. So we'll be internally um, managing and building out our own benchmark groups in order to kind of refine the product, get some initial traction on it, et cetera. Very cool. Okay, man. Probably one uh, one or two more things then that then we might have to uh, call time on this one. So again, in my notes, the other thing that's caught my eye, so you, your next couple of things to do, diversifying marketing channels. So you put here affiliate, uh, paid, social and podcast. So uh, we talked quite a bit about yep. your SEO. Um, and I, I was talking about this on a podcast we recorded earlier. That's one thing that I wish um, I have I had done multiple times over in previous uh, jobs. Like I was, I remember distinctly one of my first jobs. I was around when organic social was the thing, and then it died one day. Mm-hmm. And all we did was scratch our head, thinking, <laughs> "What do we do now?" But you know, like right, so, I've right, seen right, that right. a few times, and obviously you're, you're yeah. circumventing that. But but what else is driving that? Yeah. What's uh, what's the deal? Yeah, it's funny. Organic social used to drive traffic. It doesn't, and I don't think Mark, most marketers have really caught on yet. It doesn't do that anymore. If you use it right to as as a social platform where you're engaging with individuals one on one and all that, it works. But um, but anyways, uh, yeah. So we have the organic social, or I'm sorry, the organic search stuff working. Um, we just put some. We have had an affiliate program. We've paid out. I think like. Uh, maybe $20,000 total. So it's really just been sitting on the shelf. Uh, and so we just put someone in charge of that. We'll be creating content um, for our affiliates. Uh, many of our existing agency customers will be affiliates. Uh, and so that'll be one thing that I think gives us some control over sign up volume. Um, we just started doing some pay per click. Um, frankly, what we ner- observed is some affiliates bidding on our, our brand terms and doing quite well with that. So that's where we're starting. We're just getting started with that. We might, we're planning to hire a um, paid search specialist and do more. We have the budget now and we have um, good conversion rates through the funnel now. So I think we can get a good payback on it. Uh, so we'll start with that. That'll probably be more in Q3. Um, the big one is, is, is getting uh, partners engaged in co-marketing through the benchmark groups, like I talked about. So if they're forming groups and inviting members to people to join it, um, that will help with our sign up volume. Um, and so those are, those are the big things. Um, did I miss something? Did you ask me one of it was what there's something? Else no, no, I think, I think me? you covered it, but when, when you're describing oh, that, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of what, apart from dollars obviously a number of users yeah what what are you working towards with that is it opening the floodgates for for like raw volume and then obviously money down the line are you going upstream with the acv that type of stuff or what are you like aiming for no i love helping small businesses um we just we just integrated clear bit with our sign up um flow so we, we have a good handle on it and we're we're very much a small bit you know serving small businesses uh, of course like every Freemium company. We have companies all over the map. You know, still some Fortune 500 companies, etc. Um, but but for the most part, our com- our customers are between 11 and 50 employees. It's the biggest the biggest chunk. Uh, and so we're we're gonna stay focused on there. There's millions of companies in that range. Um, our product is pretty broad. You know, we serve um, certain segments really well. Um, but but uh, even even with marketing agencies, there's a quarter million of them um, around the world. So. Um, there's a lot of room for growth just with just with marketing agencies as well for us. So, so definitely focus on S- on SMB. Oh, I do remember the one thing. We are. I'm really excited. We're relaunching our podcast. Our podcast is called Metrics and Chill. Um, which, if you watch, greatest Netflix, name you get the ever. Idea. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so play on that. Of course, we, it is 100 percent business and professional. But uh, but we we bring people on to talk about how they improved one metric, um, why they chose that metric. Um, how they improved it, et cetera. Uh, and so we just hired someone to do that and get that going. Um, he's been doing podcasts. Obviously, John's great at podcasts, but when he's running a team with a pretty sophisticated marketing strategy, he hasn't had time to just run a podcast <laughs> as well. So um, so we brought somebody in to help us get that going. And this person um, will do a bunch of things, but but uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're hoping to do is build more brand, build more brand awareness and, and, get, and get get us out there. Very cool. All right, sir. Well, I'm sad to call into it, but but we got to stop at some point. So it's been real good fun. Thanks very much for coming on. I appreciate that. Hopefully, everybody in chat's been enjoying it as much as I have. Um, before you jump, where uh, you dropped your Twitter handle, where can people um, follow you, follow the company, and and uh, and John and uh, rest of the team? Where can they find that stuff? 
Yeah, so um, I'm on Twitter, as you mentioned, more than LinkedIn. Uh, PC4 Media, so the number four, PC4 Media is my uh, is my handle, or just Google uh, Peter Caputa. Uh, and then I am on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with people over there. All they don't, I don't pay attention to it as much. Um, Databox, uh, databox.com. All our social handles are on there, but most most for the most part, it's Databox HQ, especially on Twitter. Uh, so if you want to follow us on, on social, uh, Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram, we're fairly active. Um, and uh, databox.com slash blog, where is where we publish all of our, our content. Um, like you mentioned earlier, we're publishing quite a bit of, of uh, educational long form content there every week. All right, everybody. So my cat's actually stuck around the entire episode. So um, I hope that you thought it was as good as she said that it was. But uh, but that's Peter. Um, he's a super smart guy. Yeah. Uh, I've met him a couple of times. Uh, he's he's good value on Twitter if you want to go follow him over there. And um, with that, if you did enjoy this week's show, make sure you drop a subscribe down below for me and maybe a like and a comment too if you're feeling kind. We put these shows out once a week, normally on a Tuesday. It's on every way you kind of expect to see it. Your Spotify, your Apple podcast and so on, or on YouTube here, of course. And we also linked in live stream it as well. So make sure you follow wherever you're kind of most likely to be able to find it. And with that, we'll see you next time. Music.